Uh, it's time for our last uh, presentation before the break. And uh, Gilles Erkens is presenting uh, the framework that he and Esther Stouthamer uh, developed a couple of years ago and that is uh, still being used uh, very often, I think. Go ahead. If we have the presentation, you yeah, can uh, okay. go ahead. I'll just start talking. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to present uh, something quite different than uh, maybe other talks in this, uh, in this session uh, or in this conference because it's not a research talk in the sense that there is an empirical cycle, uh, hypothesis that is being tested, um, and uh, it's, it, this is more of a review. Or actually, this is an assessment of, um, of things that have been done in other cities around the world on land subsidence, and we needed that for the Netherlands to have, get an idea on, um, on what we could do in the Netherlands. So we learned from uh, Jakarta, Ho Chi Minh City, Dhaka, New Orleans, and Bangkok, and I should also mention Tokyo, um, and uh, that led to this uh, 6M um, approach that is used now in the Netherlands quite a bit, uh, can be used for land subsidence, but also for other um, natural hazards. And the paper can be found with this QR code. Um, so I'm going to focus uh, this talk on uh, explaining the 6M um, approach and, and I'm saying up front that this is not meant to be a, a forceful uh, approach in the sense that everyone should use this, just an example of how you could analyze what you could do on land subsidence. And I'm going to use the, uh, the Dutch case as, as an example. I'm going to go through the 6M steps and with Dutch examples and specifically and then I'll focus on the um, land subsidence as a result of the drainage of uh, peatlands and clay areas. We have talked about this uh, this morning as well, uh, but just an extra uh, figure here showing that what happened is that we uh, drained these peatlands and clay areas, we got land subsidence, and slowly the land surface was getting closer to the um, uh, to the ground level. So that meant that we needed to um, to further drain these peatlands uh, and causing more land subsidence. And the same process happens over and over again. That's illustrated with this uh, circle. So that's that's a a longer term circle of, uh, of land subsidence that happened and that led in the end let's see if this works, yeah, to, this, uh, to this map where we had several meters of land subsidence in the last thousand years in the Netherlands. So we're in this for a thousand years and that hasn't changed uh, thus far. And in the governance science, and I learned this from my governance colleagues, you call this a lock-in. So we are, we are in one way of, of working with land subsidence and there, is, there are no other options anymore. And that's the result of path dependency. So in this graph, you can see that on the, um, uh, in the left of the graph, all those stars, those are options that we had at some point in time. But by choosing and picking specific options, the other options became less likely to be picked and less suitable. And in the end, you can see that if you go to phase three, only one set of options is still available. And that's because all the institutions, our technical ability, uh, but also our, uh, our um, financial arrangements are all optimized for this single solution. And in our case, this the single solution was adaptation measures, adapting to further land subsidence by lowering those ground levels and causing more land subsidence. We have no track record in the Netherlands of mitigation of land subsidence, but that's not something we've done. In those other cities that I showed in the beginning, uh, some of these cities have a track record, so this was the led up for the 6M uh, approach. Now, it's well known from governance science that you can break free from the lock-in by having knowledge and by having an, uh, an alternative um, perspective or an alternative option. And you create one by doing research and getting insights in different uh, perspective, action perspectives and different strategies. So that's the 6M approach. It's really it's based on the policy cycle. Um, it, is, it helps with developing action perspective outside the traditional approach. That's really where it's meant for. And the ultimate aim is to have support, um, it's to support decision making, uh, informed decision making. Now, these six M's are very easy uh, to remember. I, we thought of words with, that started with an M to make it really easy for everyone. Um, it starts with measuring. Um, then you need to understand the mechanisms. So, why, so the first step is, do I have land subsidence? And uh, we've seen examples, actually, uh, Pietro, with your talk, you were all the way in the top of this. Uh, you try to measure land subsidence. And the next step, as you said, you try to understand the mechanisms. There are multiple options. And if you know that, then you can use process-based modeling to have scenarios for the future under different uh, um, policy and the climate scenarios, for instance. And those scenarios you can put into money with cost-benefit analysis to see what's the cheaper option on the longer term and the, uh, the more uh, durable option. 
Then you can take uh, measures, so you need a governance, governance arrangement and a legal framework to do so. And then with monitoring, you can see if your measures worked and you can maybe adjust them. So you go through this cycle maybe a couple of times. So now I go through the Netherlands and, um, and look at some examples here. First, M is measuring. And in the Netherlands, we have uh, made, and I think this is true for many countries around the world, great process uh, progress in that because we have now INSAR analysis available over the last couple of years. Um, and this is a map that's even quite an old map, but uh, it shows the uh, INSAR measured rates of land subsidence combined with um, a GNSS and uh, um, graphometry uh, information. Graphometry information. It shows land subsidence in the west of the Netherlands. Let's see if I can point that out here. Because of clay and peat. And here is the gas field of Groningen. Um, so this is, this is uh, there's a lot of development here. And in the other session, you can hear much more about this. But what the next step is that we need to disentangle the underlying processes. That's a step towards understanding why we have the land subsidence. And specifically in these delta areas, there are often multiple uh, different um, processes on top of each other. And one way to do that is, um, is by using extensometers, which are uh, an apparatus that measures land subsidence at different depth ranges and gives us information on where in the soil exactly what's happening. And uh, Sonica van Asselen, who has a poster, um, on this uh, technique and it showed us for instance that a lot of uh, land movement is currently happening in the saturated zone instead of the unsaturated zone something that we didn't didn't expect and that's already the first step towards the second m mechanistic understanding where we try to unravel the whole land subsidence um, signal and that's very important because first of all we need to distinguish between the natural land subsidence components and the human induced of course natural ones uh, the uh, action perspective is very different we cannot we cannot change uh, natural land subsidence, we can only adapt to it, and we can mitigate uh, human-induced land subsidence. But it's specifically relevant when you're designing measures. Um, and I'm trying to uh, illustrate that with this picture. This is a uh, geological um, reconstruction of the village of Canis in, uh, in the peat area. So this is the village here. Everything that's in brown is a couple of meters of peat layers, very susceptible for land subsidence. This is a uh, bit of clay here, and at the top you can see in gray is the artificial fill that was applied to this site to make, uh, a uh, have a larger bearing capacity of the soil and to build the village. Now the most important thing here is that the blue line here is within the gray fill. And that means that there is no oxygen uh, intrusion into the peat underlying this village. So there is no peat decomposition, which is one of the largest drivers of land subsidence in these peatlands. Yet there is subsidence in this village, and that's because the weight of the city is uh, causing uh, compaction and compression. Now, just outside the city, here where the cow is standing, uh, there is groundwater in the peat, and here you can have peat oxidation. So there we have also land subsidence, but a very different process. Now, this is really important because if you want to do, if you want to take a measure or implement a measure, for instance, raising the ground level, that won't help in the village because the low ground level is not the immediate cause of land subsidence but it will help outside the village. Then we go to predictive modeling. Um, this is the model framework that we use in the Netherlands. Um, it's a model framework that can model the shallow subsidence in the peatlands, and later the deep subsidence is added post-processing. Usually these predictive models have different uh, processes. Um, they're not integrated, but uh, added later. Um, of course, it's very important to have these, um, these measurements from the, um, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from, M from the first step to uh, parameterize the model and uh, validate uh, the model, the model outcome specifically. Um, and what's, what you can do, of course, with these models is that you can have more complex scenarios you can uh, work on. So this is a scenario where we have um, the warm scenario with a lot of climate change and a lot of uh, ongoing land subsidence. We also have a different scenario as this one, um, and that is... Um, with much less, and less land subsidence. You can see the difference between the two maps. So you can play around with different scenarios. Um, then we go to the money aspects, and uh, this is uh, quite something else. We're now getting out of the technical issues, but uh, more into the uh, social uh, domain. And you can see two houses here, and both have a different uh, level of their front door. Um, so the house on the left here has a very low f a level of the uh, of the front door, and the house on the right has a much higher level. Now, the house on the right has is on piles um, and is not sinking with the uh, with the land. And the house on the left has a shallow foundation and is sinking with the land. 
Now the house on the left is probably having moist problems because it's slowly sinking towards the ground level. So it would be beneficial for the house on the left to lower the ground level. Now for the house on the right, that will be a problem because if there are wooden piles underneath that house, they would start to rot if you lower the ground level. So this dilemma occurs a lot in analysis. It's just one example, but this happens uh, a lot. And we need to choose between the two. Now, putting things into money uh, would really help. And later today, there are there also talks on this. Um, for instance, it could show, and that, that has been shown, that by compensating upfront the houses on the right um, for their damage and trying to, um, to mitigate the damage that occurs, you can still lower the ground level, and that's the most cost-effective way uh, to have a solution for the, uh, for the damp problems in the house on the left. Uh, so this really gives action perspective uh, to the, uh, the decision-maker. Uh, with different land subsidence scenarios. Of course, it depends all on, on, the, on the speed of land subsidence scenarios. Um, finally, we go, or second to finally, we go to the, um, the fifth M, the measures. Um, and here it's important that we need to realize uh, and we need to reach out to different fields. For instance, the risk analysis field. So risk is, of course, hazard times vulnerability times exposure. And I think we, have, we can have two strategies for land subsidence, an adaptation strategy and a mitigation strategy. Whereas the adaptation strategy is focused on reducing the exposure and the vulnerability, uh, but not the hazard itself, so it's just undergoing the land subsidence but trying to diminish the damage, the mitigation strategy is really focused on reducing, actively reducing the hazard itself, uh, so trying to, uh, to, to diminish land subsidence. What we see in these cities around the world, and this is also true for the Netherlands, is that developing a strategy that's over the uh, adaptation strategy is very difficult. because most countries are in an adaptation strategy because if you do nothing you flood right so you always build embankments and dikes so there's always some adaptation or your house is uh, is um, is damaged and you, you repair that that's also an adaptation strategy but getting towards a more complex mitigation strategy or a combination of the two is really um, demanding in terms of knowledge and data and information that's need needed and in terms of research that's needed as well and this but it is this is necessary to get out of these uh, these lock-ins that we have and finally, they're, they're all very expensive, what, whatever you do. So nothing is really cheap. If you do nothing, you will have a um, disaster and you need to, to rebuild. If you do adaptation strategy, you need to continuously do levy building and rebuild them uh, because you didn't do anything about the root cause. And when you follow a mitigation strategy, you also it's very costly because you have lower agricultural production in the Netherlands uh, or we have um, uh, a new, you need a new water supply system if you think of pumping systems. The final M is the monitoring, and this is actually uh, relating to the story by, uh, by Hans earlier this morning. Um, you also talked about the maximum allowable amount of land subsidence, and I think this, we, it's crucial for the Netherlands that we will establish such, uh, such an amount here as well. And we were really inspired by other cities around the world that have this, this amount. Uh, and for me, that's a level at, uh, at, what, uh, at what level the long-term adaptation strategy is acceptable and durable. So you can you can mitigate towards that level and then go for a full adaptation strategy. That will be uh, the maximum allowable amount of land subsidence. For this, it's really important to have these damage estimates. So you cannot do this uh, and follow this mo with monitoring this uh, amount if you don't have the, um, uh, the damage that is occurring for these different scenarios. Now, we proposed a couple of years ago a uh, maximum allowable amount of land subsidence of three millimeters per year, which seems fair because then you have 30 centimeters in an, in a century that's something that we could uh, could work with in the Netherlands um, but this is still uh, very much debated so my concluding remarks are um, that um, the 6m um, approach really is a step-by-step -step guideline to indicate on what research elements you can uh, you can uh, you can work on um, so uh, for instance uh, for the case in Africa, you can really see where you are and what, what your next step should, uh, should be. But it can also thus, thus needed to be agenda setting for research programs and communicate results with stakeholders. Um, because you can very clearly show with your work to stakeholders what you were doing and why. Why it's important to have a certain economic analysis because you're working here and you've got just these outcomes and you want to go towards implementation of measures, for instance. So it makes it much more clear uh, where you are in the uh, uh, in the whole program. Um, it also connects the more technical aspects to the more societal aspects. So that makes it, it makes it very integrative and that helps a lot because that's a step that we all need to make. As also said this morning um, by Michiel. 
it enables comparison between different areas, and, uh, and this is also what we use this for. So some areas uh, may be still in the measuring and understanding mechanisms. Other ones have already implemented measures and are now monitoring. So you can compare different areas and also get inspirational examples from different areas to see what other people did and, uh, and, and what it cost uh, to get there. And finally, it's a narrative framework um, that connects land subscience to, for, to other areas, to other topics such as uh, risk assessments, um, which is hazard uh, approach, policy science and financial, financial decision making. And I think we need that because land subscience is, as we know, connected to all the other topics as well. It's connected to sea level rise, uh, to economic development, to socioeconomic development. Uh, so we need to have a framework that we use uh, to make sure that we can show what we are doing is useful and how that can connect to these other, uh, to, to these other areas. That's it, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gilles. We have time for one or two questions. I'll come to you. Yeah, Gilles, that was a great talk. Um, I, I, when I first saw your title, I thought 6M meant 6 meters, and I thought, boy, you guys are really in big trouble. Um, but no, that was great. Uh, the, the money thing, in America, uh, subsidence becomes a blame game. Um, like, who's really responsible for it? Yeah. And then, so that's where it's difficult to decide who, who pays or how, how this gets paid for. I mean, how have you overcome that challenge here? Because I, I don't even know how we would address it in America, really, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible issue. Because it just becomes a blame game and nobody wants to pay. Yeah, now that's a, that's a very good point and probably one of the most difficult points uh, preventing us from taking measures. Uh, and, and I forgot to tell that uh, the, the, the interesting thing about this step is it also shows where the cost and the benefits are located. So who is, who is beneficial from the uh, benefiting from a certain measure and who is paying the cost? And you can also use that to, um, um, to leverage between the two groups and to compensate um, between the groups. But this, uh, this step is crucial to, make, uh, to show with cost-benefit analysis what the costs are, the short-term and longer-term, and what group is getting what cost and what benefit. And I think that will makes it, make it more clear. Um, I, I know you have a different political system and stuff like that, but at least it makes it, as, this is the far as we can go as scientists, to show openly um, what the, uh, the financial streams are. Yeah. But yeah, it's the... More questions here yeah. in okay, the back. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who was first. Yeah, you go ahead. Um, thank you very much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I would be interested more to know about the, where the engagement of the local communities are. For example, or what are we talking about only the strategic or policy? Because uh, from the previous talk on the lecture, and Michel, um, he was talking about the cultural issues that people don't, w uh, don't want to relocate. Yes. And uh, is it considered in the in this framework, or is it a different level? Yeah, no, it's uh, that's a, a very good point. Um, we we analyzed um, for the city of Gouda, where we will go uh, coming Friday, uh, what for inhabitants uh, the crucial point is about land subsidence. And inhabitants in the city of Gouda, they don't care about measuring and understanding mechanisms or anything like that. They don't even, uh, if you say that the city is subsiding three millimeters per year, that it doesn't say anything to them. But um, until they have damage, then it becomes a real problem for them. So somewhere here, you get these, uh, the connection with the, uh, with the stakeholders. Now this framework is really meant for, I think, for governance, uh, government people, I should say. Uh, it's more of an abstract uh, framework. But I think uh, here, of course, you cannot implement measures if you have, don't have the support of the community, or at least it makes it much more easy to implement uh, measures with support of the community. So uh, I think it, we could also try to use this uh, framework to communicate with uh, the, the, the people in the areas to, uh, to see if, they, um, um, if, we, if we are on the right way and if we can uh, deliver extra times, types of data, for instance. Yeah, thank you. Last question. Thank you. Um, my question is on the modeling portion that you have. What is the, what drives that model? So for example, you had different scenarios where you yep. could predict your subsidence in the future. So what knobs are you turning in that model to get you those different projections? Yeah, that's, uh, so first of all, there are process-based models, right? That's because you need to you get these processes from the second step so you can do process-based models. Uh, so they, in, in our case, they, um, they model the uh, decomposition of peat uh, and the compaction of peats because of loading. 
Um, and the drivers are the ground level that you can uh, change, um, and the loading itself you can change. And of course, uh, then the setting is also the conditions are the, the subsurface, the, the groundwater system. Um, uh, and then you can infer, for instance, climate change or uh, extra ground level lowering. That you can, that, that's what you, that's, uh, those are the input uh, changes. Yeah. Okay, thank Great. you, Gilles. And uh, yeah. thanks to. Uh, thanks to all the speakers that we had uh, this morning, uh, Hans, Pietro and uh, Gilles.